Hi everybody, welcome back to my little shop. It has been a long time since I have done a video. I've been uh, away from the shop for more than the past year and a half putting up the first building on our new property. We're really excited about that, uh, but I'm also really excited to be back in the shop this winter. We have a few more buildings to put up. They'll all be timber framed uh, in all different styles. So there's lots of timber framing content coming up. But each of these buildings are going to need their own cabinets and their own uh, millwork and furniture and the whole work. So there's all kinds of stuff coming up. I have to make tongue and groove flooring and cabinets and interior exterior door, big machinery overhead doors. And of course, I have to make some uninsulated windows as well as some high performance insulating windows. So there's a lot of content coming up. But a lot of it will also involve the shaper or spindle motor work, which a lot of people are really interested in. So let's get right back in the saddle and talk about something that I get asked about a lot, and that is tenoning on the shaper, or using the shaper to make tenons. People see me do it a number of different ways. So what I thought I'd do is I'd throw together a quick video and talk about some of the different tooling options that I use and some of the pros and cons. So this is going to be limited to tenons that are between 0 and 2 inches long, mainly because when you get into bigger tenons than that, you need some specialized tooling, you need really big machines, and some specialized guarding. If you're interested in long tenons, say through tenons for a passageway door, for example, put a comment uh, down below and I'll throw together a video on that. So let's take a look at some of the different tooling options and get to some demos. I suppose it's debatable whether or not the male half of a cope and stick joint is in fact a tenon. A lot of folks would call it a stub tenon, but there's enough conceptual and tooling overlap in the execution of the joint that I wanted to talk about it quickly. I don't do very much in the way of cope and stick, but before I had some of the other tooling options, I used to get high-speed steel knives ground for a limiter head such as this. You can get dedicated carbide insert tooling for making cope and stick, and that's great for people that are doing high volumes or working in man-made or abrasive material, but for the volumes that I did, this worked well for me. So you can see on this coping or scribing knife that there is a small kind of kitchen or cabinet door grade tenon there. If you use larger and thicker knife stock, you can get longer tenons. Now to explain the limits of all that and how everything works is too much for one video, but suffice to say that even if you were to use a larger block with the thickest steel, you'd still be limited to a tenon of around one inch. Now one advantage to having knives ground for your stub tenons is you can have features incorporated into the profile that might not otherwise be possible or practical. For example, and this is, um, this is often featured in the dedicated carbide insert tooling sets I mentioned a minute ago, when you have the knives ground, you can make sure that the tongue cutters leave a very mild radius on the ends. Now this can really simplify assembly. If you imagine you've got a really stressful glue up with say a complicated door and you have a whole bunch of rails that all have to go into styles before the glue sets up. I know a lot of people really appreciate having the chamfer on the end of the uh, stub tenons and also appreciate that the tooling does it for them instead of leaving it be you know, done as a separate operation. So what are the pros and cons of doing it this way? You are very limited in your tenon length. You also have limited flexibility. Once your knives are ground, you're pretty much stuck with that. It can be very cost effective though, especially if you already own a limiter block like a lot of folks do. Getting a set of cope and stick knives is relatively inexpensive, uh, but also this can be executed on a relatively light, low power machine. Now I've shown this tooling in action before on the channel, so we're going to skip the demo and move right on to the next approach. Okay, so the next three approaches I'll talk about are basically various forms of stack tooling. Now stack tooling is where you install one or more cutter head on top of the other on the spindle. It's a very common machining strategy, not just for tenoning, but for tenoning, the first thing we'll talk about is stacking rebate blocks. Now I don't have any pure rebate blocks anymore. I just use these combi heads from Whitehill Tools, which of course combine a rebate block with a limiter head. I've talked about these on the channel. A number of times and they'll work just fine. Um, the concept is very simple. For most common tenons you would stack two identical diameter rebate blocks on top of each other and you just adjust the number of spacers in between them to suit the tenon thickness that you want. This works very well because many of these, though not all of them, have shear cut knives on them as well as spurs for very clean shoulders and inside corners. And most of them all as well are carbide so they last for a long time. In addition, this approach would employ tooling that you probably already have. The rebate block is the block most already have in their shops. Yes, you'd have to buy a second rebate block, but they're relatively inexpensive. And if you have a second machine, getting a second one is a pretty easy argument to make. 
but there are some disadvantages as well. Depending on the diameter of the block and some of the other build geometry, you're still limited to a relatively short tenon. As well, the most common rebate block is either 100 or 125 millimeter in diameter like this, but they're also usually around 50 millimeters high. So by the time you stack the two of them on top of each other with some spacers in between, you're using up a lot of spindle and you're getting up to very close or if not beyond the height of the average uh, most common spindle that would come with a machine. Now certainly a big heavy European shaper may well come with a taller shaft, but on a more modest machine you can start to run out of spindle room. Now that's just for the most common rebate block size, of course they do come in different sizes. But in addition, if your blocks are steel, and I do recommend a steel rebate block, it'll be your most heavily used block and of course subject to the most wear and tear. But if you stack two of them on top of each other, you're going to end up running into a fair amount of mass. Now, while mass is great in a cutting assembly, you'll have to ask yourself if your machine has the heft to, uh, to run that much mass. One thing you could do if you wanted to go this route for making tenons is you could buy your second rebate block in aluminum keep the steel one for your main user and keep it down low in the assembly closest to the main bearing on your machine. So depending on how you go about milling your tenons, this is something folks running smaller machines might want to think about it. Now if you're using a big side mounted tenon carriage or even one of the bolt-on ones that raises the stock up a little bit, this will be less of an issue. But if you're using a flush mounted slider off the front for example, or even a coping sled type setup, you need to verify that your machine can drop um, the lower of the two blocks down below the table sufficiently to cut the lower cheek and shoulder where you want it. Because if you think about it, it's going to be that lower block that cuts the lower cheek and shoulder for you. And you need to make sure that you can drop it down far enough to do that. Now, as you can see, on this smaller machine, even with the smaller blocks mounted, you, I wouldn't be able to do a centered rule of third tenon. Now you can get around that with a false table, but that's really asking for a lot of issues with accuracy and I wouldn't do that. Okay, so what are the main pros and cons for tenoning with rebate blocks? You'll often get excellent clean results, especially with uh, blocks configured for a shear cut, with the best being dual shear that remove material in both directions. And that's really best for the cleanest shoulders, especially at the outside surface. You'll also get, uh, it's also a relatively inexpensive option because a second rebate block isn't that expensive. You'll also get long life as carbide, of course, is very long lasting. And any jigster fixtures that you build for this tooling solution will remain functional because the blocks are basically always the same, the same diameter. Now, as for some of the bad, you're limited to relatively short tenons, but also the size and weight of this option might not be suitable for smaller machines. And even with a larger machine, you might not have enough spindle for the job. So let's take a look at this option in action. Okay, so let's talk about using adjustable groovers for tenoning. I could do a whole video on adjustable groovers. If you're interested in that, you want to learn more about them, put a comment down below and I'll throw together um, a video just on these adjustable gro groovers. They're very, very practical and handy cutter block. But suffice to say, in summary, their main reason for being is to make a groove of any width within their size range. They're typically composed of multiple nested components and you just adjust the shims in between them to spread them out to form whatever groove you need. They usually come with precision shims so you can make a very, very specific groove. They come in all kinds of different diameters and width ranges. Now, some makes and models can be inverted, spaced apart, and used to make tenons. Now, this whole subject is a bit controversial and there's some bad information out there, so I wanna be clear. Not on all manufacturers condone this for all of their adjustable groovers. So if you're not sure, you need to check. Some require that the components are nested together in order to be strong enough to withstand the demands of milling. And others may be fine in that regard, but they lose their man or their chip limiting low kickback rating, if that's important to you. So the take home message is, if it doesn't come with explicit instructions, you need to check with the manufacturer. Now with that said, setting up one of these blocks for tenoning is quite straightforward. Much like the stacked rebate block approach, 
you just simply adjust the spacers in between them in order to get the tenon width that you want. So assuming your groover is suitable for tenoning, what are the pros and cons? Well, one of the big pros is that any tool that can take on more than one role in the shop is a very cost-effective solution. If you already own a groover that is suitable for this, you may not need to invest in another tooling solution. In addition, much like the rebate block approach, you'll get very clean cut and long-lasting tool life with the carbide inserts. Now, this is, though, a more expensive tenoning solution if you don't already have or have a need for a groover. So let's get this option mounted in the machine and take a look. Okay, let's move on to my preferred method for making tenons these days, and that is with two stacked tenon discs or fixed groovers. These are by Whitehill Tools in the UK, and uh, these happen to be uh, 200 millimeters in diameter, but they're available in 150 right up to 300 millimeters in diameter. So that's six inches right up to 12 inches, and in a range of six millimeters up to 30 millimeters. Many of them are available in a Z4 configuration, so that's four cutters around the cutting circle with two spurs on top and two spurs on the bottom. Many are also available in either aluminum or steel. Now using these is just about as simple as it can be. You just adjust the, the number and thickness of spacers between the two discs to suit whatever tenon you need to make. And much like some of the other tools, you get really, really clean cuts in the carbide inserts and spurs. In fact, the 30 millimeter versions available from Whitehill are available in a Z4 dual shear configuration which gives you an excellent clean cut on end grain even in the most challenging of wood. Also where this is purpose-built tooling you can get longer tenons than some of the other options. You can get tenons from your stub tenons all the way up to the better part of five inches depending on the spindle size and the spacer diameter that you're using. So that's the good. The other side of it is these are pretty specialized tools and especially for the larger versions you probably only ever use these for tenoning. They may be more expensive than some of the other versions, and especially with the larger ones, you may need additional or different guarding. You'll also need a very well-tuned and robust machine. The larger diameter tooling has a habit of amplifying any imperfections in your spindle. So this is the last of the stack tooling approaches that I have to show you. And before I move on to a demo, I want to show you a little trick that I use to help set these up a little bit more efficiently. So this video is mostly about the, the tooling choices and I don't want to get too much into work methods because it ends up being too much for one video. Um, but I'm lucky in that I have a chain chisel mortiser. So what I've been doing is I use the different tooling. I actually take a sample and I measure the true width of the mortise that the tooling makes. And what I do is I line that up with the two tenoning systems that I happen to have used with those. So I've got the tooling performs a little bit differently with the different materials. I've got pine. Uh, different numbers for western red cedar, maple, oak, and so on. And I get a new measurement for every new material that I use the chisel tooling on. And then what I do is I correlate that directly and keep track of in, in this note page what that translates to for the number and the size of shims either between and here, this is the adjustable groover, and these are the 200 millimeter discs. And 99% of the time, when you come back to the shop with a new piece of material, these numbers will work out perfectly for you. Every now and then you'll have a different grain in some of this material and you'll find that the chisel behaves slightly different. But in terms of the precision spacers in between your stack tooling, that usually still works out perfectly. So 99% of the time, if you follow your own notes in here, if you're meticulous about them, the setup of your stack tooling will be really efficient. So let's see these in action. Okay, on to the last tenoning approach that I use. You've seen me talk about these combi heads on the channel a number of times. So I'm going to go over this really quickly. But I will put a link in the description below to a video where I talk about these in more detail. Uh, these are the large and small combi heads from Whitehill Tools. Um, they've got pitch and sawdust all over them because I use these all the time. If you're looking for a cutter block that is 
a multi-purpose block but zero compromise in terms of performance this is where you want to go this is a, a large one and a small one I'm going to talk primarily about the large one here so you can mount these in a conventional way if you want but these are also designed to be flush mounted either on top of a spindle or on a stub spindle like this So as you can see, there's no spindle protruding through the top of the block. That means that you can form the cheek and shoulder of a tenon one side at a time by letting the tenon run over the top of the block. This effectively means you are not limited in terms of tenon length that you can form by the diameter of the block. Mounted conventionally, this is a 125 millimeter diameter block, you would be limited to a tenon length of about one and a half inches. Okay, with the exception of the first option we talked about, primarily we've been talking in this video about square shouldered tenons, but this block does support coping or scribing tenon shoulders using the limiter portion of the block. Now these are some knives that I'm using for uh, making windows for the new shop, so let's get these installed in the block and take a look. Now Whitehill has dozens of profiles available off the shelf, plus you can have knives ground for whatever custom profile you might want, but you can see how with the scribing knives installed, the block works very much the same way. Now I've used these blocks a lot for tenoning over years, so what are some of the pros and cons? Well, they're a very cost-effective solution, especially if you already own one of these blocks, but you'll also get an excellent cut and very long life with the shear cut carbide knives and the spurs. Uh, it also takes a lot less horsepower because you're only doing one cheek and shoulder at a time, but you can also achieve longer tenons for a smaller diameter block. Now the other side is it takes twice as long because you have to uh, run them as stock past the cutter head twice to do both cheeks and shoulders and uh, the thickness is set by your spindle height versus using uh, a set of precision shims for example so it takes a little while to, to dial in the perfect tenon thickness and care needs to be uh, taken just to make sure that the shoulders line up perfectly so let's take a look at the large combi in action Well, folks, that about wraps it up. A bit dry, but I hope you found it informative. As you can see from the results, any of the different tooling solutions will give you an excellent tenon. Now, which choice is best for you will be determined not only by the type of tenons you want to make, but also things like your work practices, some of your existing tooling, but also budgets and some of your other technical or equipment limitations. We didn't talk about that too much because most people were really interested in the tenoning uh, tooling options that we have. Um, but... If you're interested, we can throw together a video on the various means for securing the workpiece while you run it past the tenon cutters. Also, if you're interested, make a comment below about the longer tenons. Uh, it's a bit of a different animal, so I didn't want to throw it into this video, but with, there are tooling solutions out there that will let, make, let you make very long tenons. This is a 275 millimeter diameter tenon disc, and when stacked with another tenon disc, it, you can make a over five and a half inch long tenon in one pass and there are bigger options available than this. So if you're interested in seeing some of that, uh, put a comment down below. In the interim, thank you very much for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the video and please subscribe and we'll see you next time.